Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. We're gonna to give everyone a minute to join the room and then we'll get started. All right, good afternoon and welcome to today's Link Senior webinar. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin today. We will be providing one free NAB, NCAP, and NCCDP CEU credit to participants who are joining us live today. To be eligible for that CEU credit, you need to remain on the webinar for the full hour and the Zoom meeting room will track how long you stay in the room and will send that to me as a digital report. We are not able to provide CEUs to people who join only by phone. At the end of the webinar, I will provide the required post-webinar CEU survey evaluation link in the webinar room chat box. And I will also send that to you by email this afternoon. Please be sure to check your spam folder just in case it lands there. You need to fill out that survey no later than midnight this Thursday, May 14th to be eligible for the CEU credit. And if you're not looking for CEU credit today, we still want your feedback. So please go ahead and fill out the short survey as well. CEU certificates will be issued by email on Friday, May 15th. And again, please check your spam folder in case that message lands there. You will also receive a PDF of today's slide deck by email after today's webinar. Now I'm going to hand it over to Charles Deville Morn, Link Senior CEO and co-founder. Hi everyone, good afternoon, good morning for some of you. My name is, uh, as Megan shared, uh, my name is Charles Deville Morn. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Linked Senior and it's a pleasure to have you today. Um, it's also a pleasure to have uh, Aaron Hilligan uh, on the line and presenting for us today. Erin will be talking uh, with us about leading a culture for intergenerational living. And obviously intergenerational programs is something that through this webinar series, we, we always wanted to promote. And um, we had discussions about what does COVID-19 do for our webinar today? And one, obviously, we thought we had to do the webinar because it's a very valuable topic. One would say that even these days, it has emerged as an even more important uh, topic. But I'd like to share with you a couple of things before we get into the program. Um, one is, if you have any questions for uh, the presenters, feel free to have them in the chat or the Q&A, and we will either pick them up as we talk or uh, try to get them at the end. As some of you have been on some of our previous webinars, sometimes it gets a little busy. So we'll do our best to uh, filter that. If not, we will get back to you after the presentation. So just to give you a little bit of background, this webinar series that we call Champions for Change is uh, something that we started at Link Senior more than two years ago. And it came from the fact that we felt there was a big need, a deep need for professionals working in senior living to get access to high quality education that related to person-centered care, resident engagement, and uh, to be able to do that from the comfort of their offices or their home, because we understood that in some cases, people can get CEUs or travel to their meetings, especially these days with COVID-19, but we also felt that there was a, something to be said about having a regular series to support uh, anyone working in the industry, especially frontline people. So we're super excited with our success so far. We've had over 10,000 participants. We've had fantastic speakers, including today's, obviously. And the one thing that I want to thank the audience and welcome the audience to do is to give us feedback. And uh, I'll tell you why. This particular topic today is actually a topic that we knew was important, 
but we felt it was even more important, obviously, when we had a lot of requests six months ago for programs related to intergenerational programming. So Megan online actually heard Erin uh, Hilligan on a podcast from Generations United. So we reached out to Erin and she kindly offered her time and to present to us today. So that's how today happened. But this is also an invitation for any of you, if you think of a speaker or a topic that we haven't addressed or we should address deeper, feel free to reach out. Um, you know, obviously we get the question sometimes, what is Link Senior? I'll do it very briefly today. Link Senior, we provide tools for providers to engage their residents in a person-centered way. So we have clients in 42 states in Canada. We integrate with Point Click Care. And last uh, September, our work was actually published uh, where we were able to correlate engagement with quality of life, clinical and financial outcomes. We also just recently launched a very big initiative to help people like you called Activity Strong. So this was stemmed from uh, COVID-19 and some of the pressure going on in our industry, but obviously this effort is here to stay and it is to not only acknowledge and educate, but also empower anyone that feels that older adult needs to live with purpose regardless of where they are physically or cognitively or their preferences. So with that, um, I'm going to be very brief today in terms of overall presentation and an introduction. And um, I'm going to be discussing a couple of things when it comes to resident engagement. One is one is some of the results that we've had in the surveys that we've done in the past two or three webinars. And I, and I wanted to share that information to one, thank, for the, thank people that have filled in the survey, but also explain to you why we do these surveys. In the last, since COVID-19 happened, we understood that that would create immense pressure for the typical activity or life enrichment director to do their work. And so through the surveys we did at the end of the webinars, we were able to quantify the impact of COVID-19 on your work. And we felt that one of the biggest pressure was the staffing aspect. We will be sharing that um, white paper that you see uh, next week. But as you can see, if we wanted to keep the same level of quality of activities and program, we would need to seek out anything from 140 to 224 hours of staff time per month, which is obviously almost impossible. But quantifying these things help us understand what is the impact in today's industry and how we fix it and how do we improve. With that survey came also a very simple question, which is, are we doing enough one-on-ones? You know, I always argue that we never do enough. But I think that tells us and puts us, uh, help us understand in perspective that this COVID-19 is creating immense pressure and sometimes pre uh, preventing us from helping our residents live with purpose because it's limiting our work. So that's two nuggets of information. Again, we will be sharing that with you uh, by email sometime next week. I have one thought as a way to introduce Erin and Erin's presentation today. And it's actually my favorite, uh, one of my favorite uh, quote when it comes to person-centered care. And some of you might know Abraham Maslow when it comes to the hierarchy of needs, right? We all study this. But he also has this fantastic quote when, and some of you might not know this, but he, he worked a lot in the field of dementia as well and cognitive change. And he says this thing, which is a musician must make music, an artist must paint, a poet must, a poet must write. If he is to be ultimately at peace with himself, what a man can be, he must be. Okay, so that's a fantastic quote. When you put in perspective okay. the fact that the older adults that we serve, that live in our communities, well, a lot of them have lost a fair bunch of things, right? There's the downsizing, there's the social connections and so on. But it's something that I feel we, or anyway, I forget sometimes, is the fact that these individuals are part of society, right? And being part of society means having interactions 
with any members of society, and that includes our younger ones, right? And I feel that us providers and us that work in the activity and life enrichment discipline, it's almost part of our duty to, as we try to help these men and women be who they must be, also support them with intergenerational programs. So this very quick and uh, simple quote as a way to introduce Aaron. And um, obviously Aaron is gonna be talking <laughs> Uh, to us about leading a culture for intergenerational living. But I'd like to share one thing about Erin is that although she said that she was not an expert uh, when we were preparing for this slide, I would argue that she is. <laughs> and on top of that, she is a provider like you. So I think it's an immense honor. Um, and uh, with that, I would like to thank you, Erin, for uh, uh, coming on today. And I will let you be the presenter. You should have controls now. It's all yours, Erin. All right, can you all hear me? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, let's see if I can advance the slides. Is it working? Try now, yeah. All right, here we are. Good afternoon, everybody, or morning. Um, my name is Erin Hilligan. I'm the Vice President of Operations um, at Ebenezer in Minnesota. Um, I have been around in the industry for over 25 years. Um, I started out uh, with my quest for intergenerational when I was an un undergrad. My thesis at the time was around intergenerational living and strength for falls. I had two projects. Um, and it was interesting that I ended up finding an organization that truly believed in intergen. At the time, 25 years ago, not a lot of people were doing it, but some people were. Um, so I started interning at Ebenezer got my license, I went away and I came back. So I've been here for uh, 18 years now. And Ebenezer is a nonprofit, uh, mission-driven organization over 100 years old. Uh, when I started 25 years ago, it was primarily skilled nursing and some HUD buildings and a transportation division. And over the, that time, we've really changed. We provide uh, skilled nursing, assisted living. Um, we have HOAs, the first original co-op in the nation was in Minnesota, it was in Edina, it's called the 7500 York, so that's one of our claims to fame. And our independent housing program, we have adult day and child care programs. Um, we're also part of a large health system, we affiliated in 1998, um, but I take care of the senior part of the, the work that we do. And so we have owned communities and we also have managed communities, meaning that there's owners that own buildings and we manage the operations. So it's my pleasure and honor to be here to talk about something I'm extremely passionate about and it's intergen living. So um, I think it's the next slide. It's kind of slow. I can do it if you want, you want me to do it? I just did it here. Yeah. I feel like I'm gonna hit it like okay. three times and we're gonna go too far. So um, the objectives of today, when we talked about this, I don't think it was probably five months ago, uh, was really to talk about the readiness of your community for intergen uh, framework that we used uh, and stories to enhance why intergenerationally and intergenerational living is really recommended. Um, give examples of ways uh, to provide intergenerational community, even if you don't have a child care on site. Um, and also, this was the added bonus for today is to talk about how do we maintain intergenerational li living, even during a pandemic, uh, because we have been challenged with that. So that was kind of new and added. So careful. Next slide. Did you see it? Yeah. Go ahead. All right. So um, we have uh, about six, we do have six skilled nursing buildings. Oh, go back. Six skilled nursing buildings. Um, we have about 40 assisted living, uh, 90, no, about 45 independent and HOA buildings, five HUD buildings, five um, adult days, and we have three child cares operating in our campuses and one that's just starting. So Ebenezer Ridges in Burnsville was our first original and that was where I worked for 14 years. Uh, as you can see on that stone, Stone of Health is the name of Ebenezer. That's our, our tagline. That's what Ebenezer means, is Stone of Health. So when we started the child care at Ridges, I think the original idea was it was going to be a help to the employees. 
Um, and as much as that was a great idea, that's not actually how it worked. We found out that by opening the program in Burnsville, it really became a community um, program. It wasn't just for staff. Um, some staff used it, but the program itself really became more from families outside of our walls. Um, and that was kind of an interesting perspective and kind of changed us. So the next program, the ones on the bottom, it's Tower Light in Wooddale in St. Louis Park. Um, that program started small. It's had three editions since then. Over 100 kids are, are served there. And that was a surprise. We weren't sure how that was going to work. So the second or the third one then was Riley Crossing in Chanhassen, and that opened early this year, so right before the pandemic. So that's been an interesting ride. Um, and then Pillars of Prospect Park is scheduled to open here in two weeks. So it's our, our fourth project. So what I can say is um, all of these programs have been open for different reasons, uh, but the idea is all the same. And the idea of creating a community and bringing ages together is still part of the culture of every single one of these communities. Um, and it's just been a, a pleasure to see how they've been running. All right, go ahead, advance to the next one. So a lot of people ask me, um, well, how do you do it? Like, how does it start? Um, when I had done my thesis tr research back, whatever, how many years ago, a long time ago, uh, a lot of people would say, well, you know, child cares don't belong on senior living communities because of the insurance. I heard that so many times. It's so expensive. There's so much risk. Um, and I found out that's actually not true. That's really actually not true. Um, but it does start with leadership. Um, and I'm a true believer in culture changes from the people closest to the resident up. But this is one of those things where leaders actually have to engage in the idea and bring forward their thoughts um, and then cultivate the conversation around why intergenerational living is important. So whether it's the teachers you're hiring in the childcare or teachers out in the community that you're working with, they have to see value and understand that um, intergenerational living is, is just that, it's, it's all ages. Our active living department, activities department, um, lifelong learning, uh, they're all words that we use in our organization. Uh, they have to be engaged. So a lot of times our teachers and the active living department, whether it's in the skilled nursing, assisted living, uh, our, our hub buildings, our, our skilled buildings, I think I said that, they plan curriculum together. Um, and so they think about how do they, how do they planfully provide programming? So the active living department has to be thoughtful about that. All department directors, so this isn't just about the, the, the TR department, therapeutic recreation and childcare working on it, it's all of us. Um, and the administrators and executive directors, they really have to support the vision. Um, there was one program, I won't tell you which one it is, there was an executive director that had been hired before the childcare had been decided. And I went to help her get going with the childcare and I sat down with her and the first thing she said to me was, um, well, the kids are gonna go in a separate entrance, right? They're not gonna come through the lobby. And she said, cause they're gonna be super noisy and that will just not work out. And I said, um, well, they are gonna come through the front door and you kind of do want the noise because that's life. Um, and I realized that it's not, not everybody feels comfortable around children, not everybody feels comfortable around seniors, um, but it's the team that you bring together and that vision and leadership, that's what really starts. So HR helps us, but when we interview people that we make sure that they're coming in and they understand what kind of environment they're walking in. And also spiritual care. Like I said, we're a nonprofit mission driven organization. Um, we have Lutheran roots, but we serve people of all faiths. Um, and that is part of our Intergen program as well. Next slide. So our Intergen team has come together and we've presented a couple different times. And um, people ask us, uh, like, what's, how do you do it? What, what's the plan? Uh, and we came up with this seven P's of intergenerational. Why P's? I think it just kind of makes sense. Um, but this is kind of our roadmap that we would share with others. If you can do these seven things, uh, you think about the team that you have in place, uh, you think about the culture for change that you're willing to create. Um, if you follow these P's, you'll be just fine. So let's go to the first one, purpose. Next slide. Uh, 
I apologize for all the words on the slide. I'm not going to sit here and read the whole thing. You can see it. I put it in here so you can see. This is some of the work that the group did together because it came down to, um, as people were asking us, how do you do this? And it's really hard to say, well, it really starts with the team and you have to work on relationships. Uh, but truly, it's creating, creating the vision. Um, like, what are we really trying to get to? What's the goal that we're trying to achieve? How do we know that we're actually getting there? And to, to just bring it down to very basic information, what we're really trying to do is to bring, um, to create an environment where children and seniors come together to foster meaningful relationships. Anybody can put a scheduled program on the activity calendar, but the truth is, is it really meaningful? Are, they, are we really connecting? Uh, what happens when you talk to the children or the seniors after the program? Are they able to tell you who they talked to? Are they able to share what they did? Um, are they able to tell a story about that? Um, and to focus on the whole person, you know, are, is it just not just the, the physical part of the program, but it's also the interaction? And how do we create choice? Um, I can tell you, and we'll get there in one of the P's, not everything goes perfect. Uh, and so knowing that truly the goal is to come together and have a meaningful relationship, that is when you know that you've kind of hit uh, your vision and goal. Next slide, please. So we sat down and when we talked about our vision and our goals, we also had to come to the realization that we had to have some common beliefs. Um, and again, it seems kind of simple, but it, it really isn't um, in the sense that the core beliefs, if you have people, everybody coming together, so whether it's family, staff, volunteers, residents, children, seniors, all of us are coming together and that we believe that the generations together make a difference. And so that we're not excluding anybody and we're including everybody. Uh, and then it's the relationship that counts at the end. The question really is, has this been a meaningful interaction? And we ask that after every single time we're together, whether it was uh, something that was spontaneous or whether it was something that was planned. Um, was this interaction meaningful? Does it hit our goals and vision? And that seems kind of like a calculated all the time, but it is because there are things that sometimes don't hit the mark. We have this great idea and all of a sudden we realize it's just the staff doing the program. Well, that's not the right kind of meaningful interaction. So keep going. All right, check, check, right? So we're at um, purpose and preparation. Uh, I, I uh, explained earlier that the best preparation we have is looking at, do we have the supplies we need? Uh, who's all gonna be participating? Who needs to bring forward? Um, who's going to lead the program, who's going to do cleanup, uh, is this going to be a big program, is it a small program, uh, how we might plan for something in, in, with our residents in our memory care, our dimensions neighborhood is what we call that, is different than how we're going to do for an outside parade. So what are the roles, who's doing what, and are we coordinating our systems? And we also set up a, a monthly meeting. So we get together and we look at ahead, like what do we have planned, as well as how did things go last time when we did that? Should we continue that program? Um, I explained a little bit around curriculum. The other thing that we learned that's kind of fun, families in our childcare like this idea, and the seniors kind of get into it too, but if you figure out, think about curriculum, um, science is a great one to use. Um, butterflies are great. So we had a butterfly garden, um, but that takes some preparation. Where do we find the butterflies? How do you make the garden? But it was the whole idea of the life cycle of a caterpillar into a butterfly. So that was part of the kids', uh, kids the, 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 the students, they were working on how does a caterpillar become a butterfly and the seniors helped tend the garden and then we would have reading stories around the caterpillar story. I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, and so we would, that's a really good example of how do we create curriculum around um, shared learning and that the kids can take something away and explain it to their parents and the seniors have a part of all that learning. They've all, they've all seen caterpillars turn into butterflies. What a great story. So um, how we can prepare as much as possible helps to make those interactions, again, more meaningful. All right, next one. <laughs> all right, here's two um, 
two pictures. All right, I'm going to be a little honest here. There, I'm a, it's a little self-serving. So the the picture on my left, so the gentleman with the black cap and the girl with the little um, white cap, that actually is my grandpa and my daughter. Um, so this is a personal story that I have. So my grandpa was, um, my grandpa and grandma both lived in our assisted living. Eventually they moved to the care center and my kids both grew up at the child care. So my grandpa here is, I won't tell you his age, but he was above 80 and my daughter is three here. And what they were doing was on their way to the apple orchard. So this is a great example of how do we figure out meaningful interactions. And this is my personal story. So, so this is them going to the apple orchard. So um, at the end of the day, I said to my daughter on the way home, how was the trip to the apple orchard? And she said, it was great. I sat with Grandpa Chuck. He went with me on the bus. I'd never been on a bus before. It was very bumpy. Um, he got me an apple donut and um, he even got me a muffin, but I wasn't supposed to tell anybody that. And it was great. And she was on and on and on three years old. So my grandpa, I saw him the next day and I asked him, I said, well, how did the apple orchard go? And he said, it was great. He said, your honey, that's what he calls my daughter all the time, your honey. Your honey was just great. Uh, she was a good listener. Um, I got her an apple donut. Don't be upset about that. And he said, and the best part of the whole day was she fell asleep on my shoulder on the way home. And um, my grandpa and my daughter have had a kindred relationship from forever. They did. My grandpa had passed away. Um, I don't even know, maybe three years after this trip. Um, and they're still kindred uh, friends, I would say. Uh, she prays to him and they talk and um, he's a wonderful man, but her experience with him was great. So that's one story that's very personal to me, but we have those stories all over about relationships that are made. Hence the next slide, who is uh, the gal, her name is Marilyn and that's her husband, Ken. Um, and what they're actually doing is we're at a, a music program. We partner with Mick Sale for music. Oh, yeah, thank you. And um, so we work with McPhail. I don't know, is that national? I don't think so. It's our local group that does music. And they come in and we do education and kids also come in uh, with McPhail. So Marilyn and Ken um, have been married a long time, very active in their church. Ken got ill. Marilyn still lived at home, very active with their daughters. Uh, Marilyn visited every day, was a volunteer, and um, she got to know the kids as well. Well, um, sadly, Ken passed away after a long battle with his disease. Um, and a couple weeks later, Marilyn started coming back to volunteer. She wanted to get back in the swing of things. And she went on a field trip with the kids because she had gotten to know them. And she's on the bus waiting for the kids to come on. And one of the boys, um, who four, was four years old, stopped and looked at her and said, Miss Marilyn, I'm so sorry to hear that your husband, Ken, died. How are you feeling today? What four-year-old says that? She was blown away. She came to me and she told me the story and she just couldn't believe how kind and thoughtful all the children were and how they remembered Ken and her. Um, she was touched. She's still volunteering to this day. Those are the relationships. Those are the kind of interactions that we're looking for about how we stay connected. Next slide. All right, perseverance, third P, right? Every interaction and opportunity is an opportunity to learn and grow. Rome was not built in a day and neither is successful in intergenerational programming. Don't give up, here's the truth. Not everything works out the way we think. Um, and it's okay, and it does take time. It's not for everybody, but you will find the right group of people that truly find it passionate and it just expands. Go to the next one. Go to the next slide. This is another picture. I love this picture. So this is at our adult day program. Um, this is our one of our children. His name is Liam. And one of our, our grandmas and grandpas. So different programs call our seniors grandmas or grandpas. Others call them grand friends. So the, the seniors decide. They have a resident council meeting and they decide how they want the kids to introduce them. And that's how we introduce it to the children. So this is one of those things where you need perseverance. Do you see those little um, piles in front of them? That's pudding, actually. And so the idea of that particular interaction was gonna be pudding art, that they were gonna you know, smear the pudding around and then um, draw in it. Well, Liam got a little hungry, so he started eating it and putting it in his mouth. And so <laughs> the grandpa thought, well, I don't wanna embarrass him. So he started doing the same thing. 
that was not the interaction that we were looking for. Um, but here's the truth is that's one of those things where uh, we didn't plan on it, but they laughed about it. And um, we also decided that maybe putting art will be just slightly different going forward. So keep going forward. I'm just going to stop here for a second. I see a little bit of things popping up in the chat. Um, Charles or Megan, is there anything that I need to answer? Let we go to the next slide. So right now, Erin, we have people sharing some of their own intergenerational stories and some folks are also sharing what they had planned before the pandemic happened. Um, so right now we have some great examples yeah. of what people would like to do. Um, and maybe actually a question here is how have things changed for you in light of the pandemic and, and what have you done? Uh, in the last couple months to, to keep the intergenerational programming well, gonna, going? We're going to, it's kind of towards the end of the slide deck, but I'll, I'll give you a teaser is um, it's not super easy because we don't have face to face interactions. So our um, interactions are more virtual uh, or they're more kind of exchanging, exchanging art together, uh, sharing stories. Um, so I, I, that's the truth. In Minnesota, and I don't know if it is across the nation, in Minnesota, child cares are considered essential. And so our child care programs are all open. And also being part of a health care organization, we have um, discounted rates for child care workers if their child care closed that they're able to enroll in our programs. Um, and so our programs are running at about 60 to 70 percent occupancy right now, where typically they're full. So we have seen some kids go home, but um, just trying to stay engaged. Excellent. Uh, someone All right. Share. Should we keep moving on? Yes, you can. You can keep going. All right. So patience. Kind of back to the not everything always works out. Rome wasn't built in a day. We also have to have patience. Um, so that is part of one of our P's. Go to the next slide. So this is a slide um, is around patience. This took time. So what we did is we got a grant um, for our kids and seniors, the seniors in the adult day program to take uh, pictures. And so they all got disposable cameras. Remember those, you know what those look like? Everybody got disposable cameras and was able to go out and take pictures. And we took uh, pictures of flowers, pictures of hands, pictures of instruments. We would have different um, topics of, the, of what we were gonna do. Um, and it just took patience to find the right thing. This picture right here was taken by a three-year-old. That's a 90-year-old hand and a, one of the children. Um, but it was amazing to see how much time, once we could show the kids how to use the cameras um, and what they could do with it and how it was developed and what came out of it, um, it just took patience. Uh, it didn't all work out. Lots of pictures weren't exactly what we thought, but some that turned out are, are simply beautiful. I, I personally love hand pictures. They're one of my favorites. Uh, so we have hand pictures up all over our corporate office. All right, keep going. All right, presence. So um, kind of goes back to the team piece. There's a lot of words on this slide. Again, I apologize, but I didn't want to miss out anything in case you wanted to read it later. Um, but everybody's an ambassador. If you think about that, everybody in your, your communities, whether it's the parents of the children, whether it's volunteers, it's the staff and our team members that we have, uh, our seniors, our kids, everybody's an ambassador. Um, so how we have active engagement, uh, we model behavior. So if we, um, if we're at a music program, we all sing together. Trust me, my voice is not good. Um, but I certainly sing along with seniors and, and children because um, they don't care that my voice sounds bad, but they want to know we're together. Uh, again, we're part of a, a, a Lutheran organization. We pray together. We also talk about other religions. So I just want to be really clear about that. Um, we get our hands dirty in gardening. Um, one of our hub buildings, they built a, a garden. And um, it's fun because the seniors would tend to the garden and then they would invite the children to sample the vegetables together. And some of our kids had never tasted some of those vegetables. So that was kind of fun, um, but they weren't afraid to get their hands dirty. Uh, we also model how we interact with seniors. So again, I told you my children grew up uh, in intergenerational living. And so they're my only example that I can use close to my heart. Um, but my kids know how to talk to older adults. Uh, if, if we could, they'd shake hands. And my son, who's 16 now, 
of all things, he decided he wanted to work in senior living as a culinary assistant. Could have had any job in Minnesota at the time. It was like really low, uh, low unemployment, but that's where he felt comfortable. My husband said I did a good job. <laughs> so I was happy about that. Um, but everybody's an ambassador. And so how we engage in our behavior with seniors and how we talk to seniors, uh, whether, as well as children, it's all part of it and including our curriculum. So think of your team, everybody's an ambassador. How do you get out that word and how do you uh, lead by example? Okay, right, next one. Hmm. This is one of our new child cares that opened up uh, and this uh, gal here that's reading the book to the, to the kids, of course, we can't do that right now, uh, but this was one of her favorite programs, a retired teacher. She felt this was kind of her, her calling. Uh, you can see how these kids are so engaged, but this was her volunteer work. Every week she scheduled herself um, and she loved it. And it's probably one of the hardest things with us not having these interactions is to continue them right now. We've done other ways to have our reading with our grandmas and grandpas, um, because part of that is storytelling and being in the classroom. So think about who are all your ambassadors, who are the seniors that would want to participate and be active in the classroom. It's great for them to get in there. Sometimes they'll even sit on the small chairs. Okay, next slide. They are reading over Zoom, you're right. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so this was a, a, a guy's night out. Um, if you can see that, they all made their own cars and they had a race. So the seniors had cars and so did the kids. Um, and they put bets on who's, who bets meaning, you know, like, well, uh, whose car was gonna go fastest. So just think about who's all getting invited to be part of the program and how do they get engaged as well? So you can see two kids and one senior, there it is, go ahead. I'm waiting. It's weird that I can't advance it myself. Yeah. <laughs> so this, uh, this is one of, a, a picture that I love. So in the summertime, the, the kids and the grandmas and grandpas would go out on a picnic um, every week. And this particular gentleman was from our, one of our adult day programs, and he was very active. His wife was still working in the community, and he would come to our program during the day while she was at work. Uh, he has, has dementia, had dementia, and, but he was very active, very physical, uh, liked to run, liked to sweep, liked to, to do all kinds of stuff. So he loved the picnic days. So this is a great example where he, he was trying to have the kids push him um, and, and play around. And so they were so excited that he got into the swing and that they could push him for a change. And uh, you would see him out on the playground with the kids, um, you know, hanging out. To, like I said, he'd sweep the chips in so they wouldn't get hurt. Uh, he would just like to be uh, where they were. So it was really wonderful. His wife would say it was great when she would pick him up because he had had uh, time to exercise and to be moving around and to be interacting with other people. She was very appreciative and he was off usually tired by the time he went home. So. Uh, next slide. Partnership. So this is kind of the part where not everybody has a child care on site, right? Um, nobody's asked me that yet. If it's come from the chat, I haven't seen it. I've been kind of looking. Um, so we're fortunate, but not all of our other, not all of our communities have child care on site. So we have to figure out who else we can partner with. Uh, who are those partners? Are they schools? Um, and there are teachers in our schools that are very interested in partnering. Are they churches, church groups? Are there other child cares? Um, we have a YMCA at one of our, our buildings right across the street. How do we connect with the YMCA? Um, so hospitals, volunteer groups. It's just interesting. If you get a couple people, all of a sudden, if they really enjoy it, We've had a lot of partners with our art, art groups. So whether it's McPhail for Music or Cairo's Dance, uh, Northern Clay, 
which was, is more pottery. We've gotten a couple different grants to do poetry. We have a beautiful poetry uh, that came together with our seniors and our adult day and the children. Um, it's amazing uh, how they can take their words and put it into poetry. So you start figuring out, well, where are the partners that we have that truly believe in the concept of coming together? Um, they're out there. I think it's the next slide. So I guess what I'm saying is that you don't necessarily have to have a child care on site. If you do, how do you use it? If you don't, where else can you find those relationships and how would you measure it? So you know, this is an exactly fit in partnership, but you can kind of get the idea. Um, so not only are we on our campuses and connected, but we're also connecting out into the community. This is um, at the fire department in Burnsville. Uh, the kids and the grandmas and grandpas went on a field trip this particular day, but this was actually a curriculum, a whole week curriculum around fire safety. So we practiced our fire drills. We talked about uh, what would you do at home if something happened, and we would let parents know what the curriculum was for the day, um, and then we used it as part of our ongoing uh, week, and then on their, their trip was to be able to go out and meet uh, the fire chief and see their trucks, and um, that was a big day, big day for the kids. All right, keep going. So think about where are the partners that you have that if they're not on your site, where are they in your community? Because uh, they're all out there. So Providence, this is really the money part. So nobody asked me this. If they did in the chat, I haven't seen it. How do you pay for it? Well, um, truthfully, each of our child cares have their own budget. Um, we have enrollment fees that people pay and we do pay the staff. Um, and our job really kind of is to get to break even. That's kind of what we work towards because it's really about the culture that we're building. I can say a couple of our programs do slightly better than break even, um, and, and that's okay. Um, they're, but that's really what we're working towards. Um, we do get some help with different grants. You've heard me talk about that. We do always look for grants that we can apply for. Um, and being a nonprofit, we have our own foundation and grants get um, sent out to our different communities to help. But for the most part, um, we're trying to show that we can sustain this on our own, that this is truly, uh, this is truly not just about the money. You can, you can do it, but there's also things that we have that we know improve our quality of life for our seniors and children. For example, in each of these communities, we have the lowest staff turnover in the entire organization or where we have children and intergenerational living. Under 30% is for our, our folks. We have the most volunteers. This is the most engaged volunteer group that we have. And uh, we see them consistently volunteering over time, particularly the ones that want to do things around intergeneration, like Marilyn, like I explained, she's a committed volunteer still. So people are seeking us out. Families tell us 100% of all of our families, and we survey them every year. We do an annual survey with them. 100% of our families of child care pick us because of intergen. And the reasons that they cite is they think um, seniors are important in their children's lives. They don't have grandparents um, in around anymore or they live in another state, um, that they see it as a value that they want their children to be brought up with. Um, I find that fascinating, 100%, because there have been people in my time that have said to me, um, people don't want, the, 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 the two ages shouldn't be together. And that's simply not true. That's just an anomaly. Maybe some people feel that way, but not everybody feels that way. Other people have told me that seniors won't choose um, senior living if there's kids there. That's not true either. There might be some seniors, but actually most prefer to know that they have purposeful, meaningful interactions. And so whether it's volunteering, it's being part of a community, they like to see and hear the kids um, singing and doing art. Uh, they feel more alive um, and you can see it. It's, so if people tell you that, it, they might, it might be true for that one person, uh, but please don't believe that that's all people because it's just simply not. Um, just like not everybody likes cats or dogs, I guess. Um, uh, you know, people will choose where they feel most comfortable. So we do have to work within our budget. All right, go ahead. Next slide. Erin, we did have a question come in. Um, do you have to worry about liability oh. with certain activities or in different locations, such as a playground? So it's a liability question. Um, no, we have insurance just like everybody else does. Um, some people will ask me about memory care, honestly, not necessarily the playground, um, but it's just we have our regular insurance. Um, our 
playground that we have that has, it's a shared playground with our adult day and child care and at Ridges. Um, it's set up with two entrances right onto the playground. That's how it's insured. I mean, they're being monitored. We're not just letting people out there. There's staff out there. People are there with them to see what's going on. But it's, um, as far as I know, we, we're insured. Everything's going fine. We haven't had any Thank issue. You. Yeah, are there other questions, Megan? There's another one uh, that has to do with virtual programming. So I can ask that once you get to that topic towards the end, if you want. Okay, perfect. Um, so I, I threw this picture in here because it was just Mother's Day last weekend. And this was a Mother's Day tea uh, that the residents and the children were having. So this was just a ladies tea. They all wore their hats and their scarves and had um, tea and, and snacks. Um, so again, we try to honor everybody in our community and bringing them together. Uh, so true culture change uh, really requires an investment. It's not just a program. Um, it's not just bricks and mortar. It's not just a business model. It, it really is about focusing on people. Uh, I was telling Charles earlier, um, with the pandemic, it's been interesting for me because I spend a lot of time thinking about quality of life for those who are serving. And right now there's a lot of focus on safety and I think it's really important. Uh, safety is important right now. Um, and so we're kind of missing sometimes like a ladies tea. We didn't have a ladies tea this weekend. Uh, we had some Mother's Day parades and other things that we did. Um, and we'll get there again, I know, um, until we're in a safe place. But for the most part, um, I really think the relationships are what build a community. Um, and that's what intergenerational living is. It's when you stop seeing age and you start seeing how you live together. All right, next slide. I like their pink hats. <laughs> so I know some of you had asked me, oh, what do we do now during COVID-19 or the pandemic? Uh, we still work on continuing our relationships. We have virtual visits for the most part. So that's how we stay connected, whether it's reading books or exercise or some one-to-one -one visiting that we're doing. Um, if you go to the next slide, I think it shows how one of those visits looks. Us, um, Grandpa Bob. Um, and so they're staying connected, especially for the seniors that they know and the kids. And we have iPads. Um, again, we're doing book reading that way. We have Zoom meetings. Uh, we're exercising together. We like it. Um, I think people are still missing seeing each other, though. That's the truth. Go to the next slide. We also try to use the outside. Um, so as it's getting nicer here in Minnesota, um, we like to get out. Uh, so kids have been doing out sidewalk chalk and sending messages. Uh, we have music outside, so we might have uh, somebody that's doing the bagpipes or singing and then we'll all sing together. Uh, the kids have done a couple different parades. If you go to the next slide, I think it's an Easter egg hunt. So we set it up so the kids could see, uh, the seniors could see the kids doing the Easter egg hunt. It's not the best picture. Uh, they're in their, uh, um, playground so the seniors on that side of the building could see the kids. Yes, it did snow on Easter in Minnesota. Terrible. Um, but that's what we did. Um, so they're out there running around and showing their Easter eggs. And then we sure sh was able to show them uh, via Zoom how many eggs they collected and, and what was in each one. So, okay, next slide. Erin, there's a, there's a quick question here. What activities do you do for kids and those who are nonverbal? Uh, like our seniors that are nonverbal? Yes, I believe that's what this person that was, meant. This, okay. Um, so I think I would probably answer that question best for our residents in, in memory care. And not today, but when we were able to be close together, we would do more things with with touch, uh, so whether it's a um, kind of like holding hands, or if we would do a massage, or we would do paint, or if there was something that we would s smell, like flowers that we would do together, um, we would include every everybody's included. So trying to connect with each one of those residents and children. Um, so that's where we have the teachers as well as the um, active living department to help us to make sure we're including all people. Maybe one thing I didn't share in the very beginning, one thing that is slightly different when we hire teachers is we also educate them on dementia 
And so they go through a different orientation than maybe other child care teachers would go through around aging and seniors. And specifically, we spend um, a good amount of time around memory care. Um, interestingly enough, our seniors in memory care are probably the most engaged with our children. And I think a lot of people thought they would be the least engaged, but that's where we have a lot of engagement. So um, they're interested, they wanna participate, they wanna be there. Um, and so we bring everybody together, it works out really well. All right, um, so some of our consider, oh, yeah, so some of our considerations right now that we have is they're not face to face. And so what did I say, spend the last whatever 40 minutes talking about how important it is to have relationships. So using Zoom isn't that great, even though I'm seeing you all and saying hi. Um, we, we we're waiting for the day that we can be back to face to face. So we still use that Zoom, we still stay connected. Um, we also had a talk had kind of some conversation around how do we notify families even though our children aren't participating we are still seeing we do see COVID positive staff and residents in our communities just not in the child cares uh, do we keep them up to date on those things and, and the short answer is yes we have been letting them know what we're doing to keep our seniors safe and our staff safe um, we just believe it's good to be transparent about what we're doing and, and trying to keep everybody safe as well as we do screen the staff and children coming into the program, just like we do on the senior side. So kind of keeping up some of those same protocols that maybe other child care centers wouldn't do, uh, we're, we're just kind of ingrained into our healthcare work right now. All right, next slide. Erin, we, we just had a quick question that I thought, um, can you get public schools to participate in this type of programs? Well, um, we have had, um, Different public schools, I, what I have learned is that there are just certain teachers that are really in, into it and enter. It depends what you want to do. Do they do visits on site or do the kids uh, or to come to seniors or do the seniors go out there? The, we've had some reading programs with more like third and fourth graders where we've had seniors be ambassadors for reading programs. So I, I, it can be done. I think it's just finding the right teacher um, is probably the best way to say that. Thank you. So here's an example of something the kids did to show the grandmas and grandpas that they were thinking of them. These are all their arms. So they did hugs. So they traced their bodies and then they um, colored them in and then they sent them to the grandmas and grandpas to put them into their lobby so they would know that they're giving them a virtual hug. <laughs> so um, it's things like that that we're just trying to make sure that the seniors know the kids are thinking of them and um, the kids are also engaging in, oh yeah, I, I want to give them a hug. Um, and it's not exactly the same, um, but it, it's, we're all trying, right? We're all trying to adapt in this time of COVID. All right, let's see, let's see the next slide. Oh, <laughs> so this, we're getting towards the end here. So um, this is the secret sauce, not necessarily the secret sauce. Some people will say, what is the secret sauce? And truthfully, there is no such thing. So this is what I'm saying. It's a spoonful of kids, so you gotta find some. A spoonful of older adults who wants to participate, a dollop of programs in one setting, bringing them together, a dash of different opportunities for interactions. How do you make it meaningful? A pinch of risk. I'm telling you, there's a little bit of risk here. If you're not comfortable with failure, this isn't probably going to feel right because there's going to be something that doesn't go exactly the way you thought. Um, but also there could be things that go way better than you could have ever expected. Um, a drizzle of laughter. We laugh all the time um, because it, it can be funny. Uh, a cup of enthusiasm, is this something you really have the energy for? Because again, it's, it's not always easy, but the, the excitement for it and the positive relationships and the stories that you can tell uh, create that ounce of passion and with lots of love. I am a true believer in leading with love versus fear. And so this is one of those things, if you see people and you, and you just love it, um, this will happen. Um, but you got to put yourself out there. All right, next slide. And the good news is that we do have time oh, for let's your video. Stop here. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. We do have time for your video. You want me to play it? Well, hang on a second. Should we see if there's some questions that I have answered? So this video at the end was kind of like if we had time, uh, folks, it's about four minutes. And so I want to make sure I know we end right at two. So yeah. um, is there questions that I haven't answered? Uh, so th the question about virtual programming is, have there been any challenges with uh, older adults who may not be online, don't have a computer, the availability of the internet, or challenges with technology, and how have you overcome any of those? 
so most of our seniors are in our senior buildings and the, the therapeutic recreation or active living staff are helping them set up those visits. So I haven't heard that they have wanted to get connected with the seniors or with the children and haven't been able to, but usually they're being assisted by the team, if that helps. So we know that the visit is happening and, and how it can get done. Um, I haven't heard if there's been a, an attempt when, you know, because we need, we need them to both be on at the same time, I guess. So, so far, it's been fine, but I could see that if, if it wasn't planned. Excellent. And someone also asked, do you have any suggestions on how to encourage other department heads to help with activities? <laughs> well, this is my own opinion is why wouldn't they want to? Yeah. Um, I was interviewed for a job a long time ago, and this is different off topic, but I had talked about pancake breakfast. And I love making pancakes for the seniors and kids. I just love it. It's just one of my favorite things to do. And I was talking about it. And um, one of the directors asked me, well, will you make it? Will you make us all make pancakes? And I thought, well, who doesn't want to make pancakes? <laughs> really? It's like a half hour of time. So um, that would be more my question is, you know, if, if they don't want to, why? Aren't we part of a family? Uh, so I, I don't, I wouldn't make anybody make pancakes. I would just be more curious why they don't want to make pancakes. <laughs> so I don't know if that's the right answer. Excellent. And the last thing was just a comment here. Um, it seems as though this would work really well with Montessori based programming. So I didn't know if you had a comment about that. Yes. I, I'm a huge believer, except for we do not follow Montessori programming. And there is all kinds of research around Montessori programming and memory care. Um, that is on my list of things to figure out for the next child care we open. I, I really, I think there's a total, it only makes sense to me. Um, I'm not a teacher, but I've studied it enough. It, it seems like it really makes good sense, especially for memory care. We can use a lot of that learning too with our seniors. All right. You want to go ahead with the video, Charles? All right. Well, we yeah, have uh, so minutes left. So, Erin, uh, is it okay if we share the video by email with the with the audience? Sure, that's fine. And so, all I would say to the audience is, um, this was one of my students did this for me once while we were on our journey, and I, I love it. Um, and so, if I ever have a chance to share it, I, I do like to. But it is four minutes. I think we're down to two, right, Charles? Yeah, we are. Yeah. Erin, I, I just wanted to share with you one thing, which is you know personal to me. You know, you shared a little bit of your experience, but I. You know, I sometimes get this question, which is why I started Link Senior. And obviously, I had very strong connections with my family and the older adults. And I, I feel very privileged about it. And I sometimes joke about the fact that because of that, I've never been scared of older adults, which is kind of a funny way to put it. But I, you know, the, the reason why I think is so valuable this type of work and the work you do is that you create a bond between generations which allow people like me or anyone else to, you know, obviously not being scared, but beyond that, develop a love for the older adult and actually anyone else in, in society. And I think that sometimes it's a little bit missed these days in society. And I think that these bonds are necessary for us to thrive as a society. And so with that, I, uh, I just want to thank you for the work and, and uh, being a true expert in this. And uh, with that- <laughs> I'm just a person doing the work, I'm just telling you. Well, yes. I mean, I think we're all doing some level of work, but you know, you um, doing this for years and being with us today, uh, I just want to thank you for that. So thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. This was a nice break in my day and I, yeah. I really appreciate it being asked. Thank you. Sure, anything. So everybody on the line, as you know, uh, Megan is going to cover a little bit about the surveys, but as you saw, uh, we love asking you questions so we can share information with you. Um, there's a couple of thoughts, a couple of things I wanted to announce also about uh, Link Senior, and it's specific to our Activity Strong initiative. I wanted to invite all of you to go to our Facebook page where we actually started a group, I think three weeks ago or four weeks ago now, which is all about activities and life enrichment. Obviously, a lot of the discussion these days are focused on COVID-19, but we want this discussion to be inviting everyone and really focusing on how can we um, really acknowledge the work of our staff, of us, uh, educate, 
and then obviously empower, especially frontline staff, so they can engage the Odoi Dot with purpose. With that, and part of this initiative, we launched a website called activitiesstrong.com. And you probably remember from last webinar two weeks ago, we um, are hosting a virtual summit, a whole day with up to six CEUs for uh, NAV, so nurses, administrators, activity directors, life enrichment professionals. And we're extremely excited. We've been able to attract um, very high quality speakers um, and they're listed here. The event is free and it will be hosted on Zoom the way we did it here. The last thing is, as you might remember, but I, if you haven't heard of, about this, I'd like to invite you to take benefit of it, is part of the Activity Strong Initiative, Link Senior has decided to make uh, some part of our services free for any communities or providers out there, whether it's assisted living, memory care, or nursing homes. So for this, you just need to go to our website, um, hit the blue banner here, and then under the blue banner, you can sign up. And until July 4th, we're making uh, part of our services for free for activity directors, and it's mostly the app that allows you to engage your residents. So with that, I know we're past time. I want to thank again, Aaron, for joining us. Um, remember that all people are cool. Uh, we have this website called All People <laughs> Are. Um, here are Aaron's details, and here are uh, the upcoming webinars that we have. Megan, it's up to you. And Erin, thanks again for joining. Thank you, thank Charles. You. Uh, oh, as Charles mentioned, here is the list of upcoming Link Senior webinars. I have just posted the CEU survey link for today in the chat box in the webinar, but also keep an eye on your email. I'll be sending it that way as well this afternoon. In that email, you'll also have a PDF of today's presentation. We'll send along Aaron's uh, video, a link to that, so you can watch that. And as Charles said, we hope that you will sign up for the Facebook group and our virtual summit on June 23rd. I will send registration information uh, for those items as well. And Charles, I'll ask that you end the broadcast recording now and we will leave the webinar room open and I will repost the survey link for everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks, Aaron. It was, uh, it was nice to have you. My phone got me. No, I was just thanking you. And uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming. <laughs> am I off? Am I, am I done? Well, I'd like to start the, uh, I mean, we, you and I can talk, it's fine. I was just trying to see how I can. My phone is really cutting out. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yeah, and I can't hear you very well. Hang on a second. I just did that now. <laughs>